My name is Mike Skolnick, and I play with two gamer tags, either Mike the TV or PhDJ. Mike the TV was a character in a cartoon show called Reboot. He was a loud, annoying, anthropomorphic television, and I see a lot of myself in him. I think when I'm actually on an extroverted streak, I can channel some of that loud obnoxiousness. Um, I'm from Montreal, Canada, and I found my way into the scene um, around Shadowloo Showdown 2011. Um, I had a friend playing in the local fighting game who doesn't show up anymore. His name is um, Andrew Bond. He played under the gamer tag of Pachi, and he brought me into um, into playing Street Fighter 4 and the wider community in general. I'm not sure there was anything specific. It was uh, Street Fighter 4 was a game I was playing casually with friends, um, but I didn't really give the the wider community very much thought. Um, eventually, I started uh, after sort of seeing tournament play and how exciting it was and how into it people got, um, and I think looking for a distraction from all of my schoolwork, I managed to just sort of catch on to some of that and start coming out to more stuff. Um, I'm just finishing up a PhD in media studies right now. It's central, uh, centering on video games, scholarship and research. I've got a few articles published and things like that. Um, so I'm pretty into video games academically um, and in terms of playing them. Uh, my main game is Street Fighter 4 Arcade Edition version 2012. For now, I've also picked up KOF 13, so that might eclipse it. In AE, I play as DJ. Um, I'm a bit of a character specialist with him. Um, sometimes, because I like pressing buttons, I play Kami as a secondary, but it's neither as good nor as fun. Um, in KOF, I play teams involving uh, Billy, King, Kim, and Kenso at the moment. Um, because people who live in Melbourne are masochists. Oh, you I done it too. I done it too. <laughs> when I started in the community, I got the impression that it was more of a cliquish scene than it actually was. With the benefit of um, some time here and showing up regularly and showing interest and contributing to the scene, that's kind of eased off and become less of a problem. Though I can still see how new players and arrivals into the scene could grapple with similar problems. Um, what I'd like to say to those players is, um, after perhaps overcoming that initial period of resistance, it is a very friendly scene to be in. That's a big question with a lot of possible answers. Um, the first one, I think, is a little bit outside of the community's immediate control, and that's that people are going to gravitate toward um, new, exciting games that they enjoy playing. Um, there haven't been a lot of those in the fighting game community recently and in the genre. So for, for one thing, I think it's a bit of a struggle for the fighting game community to struggle to keep people interested in games that, while they're still tremendously deep, begin to feel a bit played out and um, in some instances frustrating. 
We're also in an interesting transitional period with our local scene since our main fighting game venue is um, closed for relocation and we don't know when they're opening up again. So um, having community-based events like um, this Chris's Clubhouse that we're filming in, obviously a really nice way to get people together. Although quite honestly, I think one thing that um, would be nice to see, especially with the sun coming out, would be fighting game players like going outside and like to a beach and throwing a frisbee around and having a barbecue and like doing stuff that's a bit removed from the actual playing video games. We can play video games anytime, but that's not always the best way to get to know each other as people. I think a lot of people in the fighting game community view like playing fighting games and competition as the end in itself, and I don't. I'm probably neither good nor driven enough at fighting games for that approach. Um, I tend to view fighting games as a means to, um, as a means to meet people and make friends and develop some other skills, like my public speaking skills, which I've been developing through doing commentary work in the scene. So I've been using fighting games as a springboard for doing other stuff and meeting people. So I was involved with competitive StarCraft Brood War uh, a number of years ago and did um, and sort of cut my teeth on commentary there um, on, on YouTube doing casts of um, Korean Pro League matches as well as some other like international tournaments and show matches and things like that. In the local scene at the time that I came into it, no one really was excited about the idea of doing commentary. We were starting to get live streams going, but like filling the content was really hard. You could have like just the gameplay footage or have someone fairly unenthused about commentary talking over it. And it wasn't really all that great of a situation when we were like, you know, when Shadowloose Showdown was starting to develop and we wanted to sort of grow it. So I just, I told the local tournament organizers, namely Ali, like, it's like, hey, like I've done a little bit of commentary. I could try to do it for Street Fighter. And incidentally, adapting from commentating StarCraft to commentating Street Fighter was really hard. Um, typical StarCraft Brood War game could last about half an hour, 35 minutes. Um, like you'd get some faster ones, but you'd always have some lulls in the action and different stages of the game. So you'd have the early game where they're just building worker units and mining and developing their economy and making the beginnings of the strategic choices. A round of Street Fighter is over in about half the time it takes to do that and you have to convey a lot of information really quickly. And so coming out of StarCraft, which is comparatively low paced, making that switch is actually really difficult. I think a lot of people underestimate how difficult fighting game commentary is. Um, and I say that having done both like what I feel is good commentary and like some pretty bad commentary recently. So viewers might recognize me as the commentator who did both days of Shadowloo Showdown this past year, um, where I felt like my performance on day one was absolutely awful and on day two was like pretty good, especially like coming off of that and being a bit psychologically shaken. It's not easy to commentate, it's easy to talk um, it's easy to give an opinion. It's really difficult to be both informative and entertaining at the same time, and I think that's the goal of commentary. Um, we have some people who can just be entertaining and not informative, and I don't think that's really all that great, and it's also a fault of mine to skew too much to the other direction. Striking that balance is actually the, the really difficult part in commentating, and especially commentating in a duo, which seems to be the best way to do it. Good tech, great tech. That orb's about to expire. Nice. But Luffy has one meter. This is still dangerous. Oh! <laughs> I think there are a lot of comment uh, like a lot of potential commentators that we can bring in, but that last year at BAM we just weren't able to. So for example, um, Troy Nelson, aka Moose King from Adelaide, is um, 
a bit of a controversial commentator. Not everyone adores his style of commentary, but um, he's certainly competent at it, and um, he devotes more time to uh, fighting game commentary in Australia than anyone in Australia, um, me included, and by a wide margin. He's like he's dedicated to that craft, and he has a background in broadcast journalism. So I think, like you know, given a good partner and some time to refine it, he'll he'll be cranking out really quality commentary. It was also really unfortunate for him that um, at Adelaide's major in November, they had a stream set up, but weren't able to get uh, the commentary audio, and that could have been a breakout a breakout event for him and his local community in general. So I'm hoping to see more commentators um, willing to, one, travel, two, commentate and contribute. So people like Moose King or Goodpart from Sydney or um, Glassy from Queensland. A lot of, there are a lot of capable commentators, it's just we haven't really managed to get them onto the mic. So if we manage to, that'd be great. Some of the, the features of competitive gaming that have kept me coming back in general and that certainly apply to fighting games are the, the psychological mind games of competition between two players in a game of imperfect information. So in the same way that I can enjoy um, juking somebody out in League of Legends, I can enjoy doing that much faster, much more frequently in fighting games because that's the pace of the game and it's one-on-one. -on -one. So um, it, it gives me that experience that I like to have of matching wits with somebody, but in a really concentrated, fast-paced kind of setting. Find some friends to play with at around the same level as you and at least one person who is significantly better than you. So you can develop playing with your friends and then you can go and get smashed and figure out what things you need to refine. Um, above all, I think it's about surrounding yourself with people that you want to hang out and play with and that you enjoy playing with and that aren't toxic around you and don't sap your enjoyment. The people are really the, the fundamental thing. Um, as far as like some resources for new fighting game players to look at, there are obviously things like your shoryuken.com wiki and character forums and stuff like that. But one of the best fighting game related videos that I've ever seen was of um, Juicebox Able explaining, um, explaining frame traps and mix-ups in Street Fighter 4. This doesn't hinge on guessing, it hinges on your ability to predict your opponent's next move. If you think he's gonna tech, you should go for a frame trap. It's about a 40 minute video, so it's in a lot of depth, but it also goes into like the psychological joy of mix-ups and like why they're effective and why frame traps are a thing. And so there's a lot of this really like, there's a lot of this dense terminology around fighting games that can be a bit of a put off, but once, um, that's, an, a really, that's a really good way to get at this really big jargony idea. Um, but also to kind of open your eyes to what's possible in the game in terms of mind games really early. So I think that's a really useful thing for people to have a look at. Okay, if I push pause, just ignore me. Let's keep going, because I'm gonna push pause. I didn't really participate in Montreal's scene um, very much before, um, before coming out here. Um, I really sort of got involved in fighting games after making my move to Australia. On my last visit back to Montreal, though, I had a chance to meet their scene, um, or a good, a good chunk of it anyway. Um, they have a really neat venue in Funzo Cafe, where they've got a number of um, hand-built cabinets as well as like console setups. So that's been a place that the fighting game community has gravitated toward. It's a really nice venue, and they serve cheap Asahi, so I'd recommend to anyone visiting Montreal to scope the place out. I found Montreal's scene really approachable. Things uh, like the, the language divide in Quebec not to be an issue, so it was, it was good. There's a universal language, and that's the uppercut. Oh, 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 oh,
couldn't kill him anyway. Even if I DP, I couldn't kill him. I think one of the things that keeps people away from the fighting game community is the way that the fighting game community can appear in some of its more outward facing things. So in things like streams or even at some live nights in venues. So um, the fighting game community being very sparsely populated by women is something I think we're all kind of well aware of. And I think that there are a few things that we could do as a community to interest women because I, I have generally found that they're plenty interested in playing the game, but they are plenty not interested in dealing with some of the garbage that they have to when they come out to a night like this or they watch a stream. I don't want to get like really puritanical about this, but like, I think, you know, like, a woman watching a Marvel stream and hearing a commentator screaming something like, kill the slut whenever Morgan is hit by the first hit of a combo can be really off-putting when, like, sure, like, it has nothing to do with them directly, but it just kind of resonates with, like, a lot of, like, gendered expectations and abuse that they might have to deal with outside. And like, I think a lot of people, men, women, like whatever identity alike, look for in their hobbies is an escape from that sort of thing. We can probably go a long way toward like cleaning that sort of stuff out um, in at our at our venues on our streams, like you know, enforcing some guidelines for commentary, yes. Um, you know, making it clear that the organizers are approachable if someone has some complaint about abuse at a venue. These are things that we, we kind of assume we have, but because it doesn't come up very much, we get really complacent about it. And I think it's actually just something that we need to sort of collectively have an open conversation about. One other thing I just want to add about this when talking about commentary guidelines especially, a lot of people in the fighting game community, I find, struggle to see the forest for the trees on this question. Where it's like, oh, we should like do this so we can bring in sponsors, and suddenly it's not the FGC and it's esports. That's the tree. Um, the forest is, we should do this because we want a more inclusive community in general, and the rest of that will follow. I think that that's one of the sort of fundamental misunderstandings a lot of people have about the FGC, whether that's rooted in some kind of like rose-tinted nostalgia about the way arcades were. Um, and this is just like maybe a bit of a, a ranty comment, but like if that kind of misogynistic, hyper-competitive arcade culture was that great, the arcade industry wouldn't be dying in the Western world. Oh, it, man. <laughs> what would I like to see at BAM this year? I would like to see a return of the pre-tournament dinner at Pizza by the Meter because that was great. And I'd like to actually see that go large. Um, yeah, I'd like to see, I'd like to see a lot of peripheral stuff. I think the tournament is going to be you know, pretty reasonable as far as tournaments go. A dive kick side event would be nice, I'm not gonna lie, but I'm not necessarily holding my breath for that one. Um, but a lot of a lot of stuff around the tournament would be really nice. So like, um, yeah, tournament dinner, um, like drinks outings open, like, you know, open to attendees at large. Um, a schedule that would accommodate people being able to step outside and enjoy our weather before it turns in 10 minutes. That is a big, that is a big and difficult question. Music is a big part of my life and always very mood dependent. Um, Stuff I have particularly been enjoying listening to lately are um, Power of Stellar's Coco album. It's a two CD of, um, one CD is basically loungy house and the other is electro swing, which is a genre that I really enjoy. 
Um, also, I've been listening to um, the Scatolites occupation songs. So 1960s first wave Jamaican ska, very nice. Um, and for those chiptune lovers out there, Chipsel's Phonetic Symphony album was fantastic. And her most recent album, Spectra, is also really good. Um, you can find me on Twitter at the PhDJ. So that's the PH and then D double E J A Y. Um, that's kind of my main internet presence these days. Shout outs to those viewers who have enjoyed my commentary on tournaments in the past and um, those who haven't but have managed to offer constructive feedback about it rather than just telling me I'm shit. Cheers. Mediums. Sorry? Oh, huh? Are you going to release on one of the stand mediums? Oh, right, nah. No.